joined this week by Luke Graham. Uh, Luke was Member of Parliament for Auckland South Perthshire from 2017 to 2019, uh, elected as part of that wave of Scottish Conservatives who became an influential force uh, in the second May government and that minority government, uh, saving the day by coming down from Scotland and uh, avoiding disaster. Um, he then, after uh, losing his seat to the SNP in 2019, moved into the heart of government and uh, worked on the union unit, uh, driving union policy across government before uh, leaving earlier this year. So there's a lot to talk about, about uh, what the government does on the union, what it should do next, um, and how unionists can make the case uh, against a second independence referendum. So, Luke, if we start by talking about the union unit, it had previously been something of a behind the scenes uh, operation, um, but then surged into the public view a, a couple of months ago um, with your departure and then the departure shortly afterwards of your successor. Um, I think we now know also that it's been replaced by a cabinet committee chaired by the prime minister. So I think it would be useful just to understand what was the union unit and what did it do? Sure. Well, good morning. Thanks for having, thanks very much for having me on. Um, the union unit, I mean, it's been, it's been around for a while, you know, the union issues were covered uh, in the May administration by kind of one, one SPAD who was holding things together. The initial unit was kind of, again, one SPAD as well, who had the position for, for just a, sh a few short months before I came on board. Um, and the brief really was to try and address the imbalance in Westminster, in Whitehall specifically, um, between kind of devolution and union, um, and try and make sure that the heart of government was looking at all parts of the UK rather than just England, um, was to have a, to build a team at the centre in, you know, number 10 and in the cabinet office that could then, um, you know, effectively join up policy across government to make sure it could work and make sure you could more effectively deliver for Scotland, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So you had been a uh, member of parliament before then, so you'd seen how it worked in practice um, and obviously been a, a PPS in the cabinet office as well. Was your experience that, uh, that the government needed that kick or Whitehall needed that kick? Um, how, how is the system set up to actually take account of all four nations and not just England where so much is, is devolved? Um, I think it, it was it was needed um, and it needed also uh, yeah, the PM to come in and really say, look, this is a, a number one priority for me. Um, because after you know, 20 years of devolution, it has all just been very much a, a one way uh, kind of escalator with just powers, more and more powers being transferred, not necessarily to the Scottish Parliament, but to the, the, uh, the administration in Edinburgh specifically and a few more powers for the for the Welsh government as well. And, and this one way direction of travel had just led to a culture in Westminster and Whitehall of devolve and forget. Um, a lot of civil servants, a lot of spads, a lot of ministers simply wouldn't consider uh, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland if the issue was devolved or, or transferred. And so as a result of that, it really did need a, a bit of a reset to say, actually, you know, you've got certain issues that are specific for England. That's fine. And, and certain ministers deal with that. But actually, certainly for those sat around the cabinet table, they are British ministers responsible for all parts of the UK. And where there's a specific reserve responsibility, they need to take direct control. And where there are devolved responsibilities, and maybe should be working in partnership, try and make sure all levels of government work together. And I, I don't think, you know, and I saw this in MP, that wasn't happening. Um, and there's been dysfunctional government. Now, some of that is um, by intention because the SNP don't want the UK to work well so they put up walls and barriers and wedges uh, as much as they can between you know central government devolved government local government um, but it's also a little bit by by culture within Whitehall that simply wasn't set up to proactively go out uh, and try and engage with the devolved administrations uh, it, to push kind of UK wide policies and make sure that people in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland were benefiting from government policy as much as those in England. So there's been um, a particular attention on, on that point in the last couple of weeks with the, uh, the long awaited publication of the Dunlop Review uh, that was looking at how the UK government can do all those things better. Uh, what did you think of Andrew Dunlop's uh, conclusions and recommendations, particularly about the idea of a minister for the union that can instill that across Whitehall? Is that the way that we should be going? I think um, uh, Andrew Dunlop's report had a, a number of really positive proposals and quite a few of them have been in, been followed through. You know, um, government has built up now a team in the in the cabinet office and obviously there was some resource in number 10 as well 
for kind of union issues to act as kind of that coordinating and driving function. Um, he wanted to see some more power go to the territorial offices. Um, I'd like to see that too. I think that's a really, really positive uh, step. Um, also, you know, looking at intergovernmental relations, I know an enormous amount of work has been done in that area and hopefully we'll end up with a more robust and transparent set of mechanisms for you know, central to devolve to local government to operate um, after the devolved elections in May. Uh, certainly if the, the devolved administrations can agree with central government, the, the format. So there are a number of proposals in, in the I think were really positive. In terms of Minister of the Union, I, I, I agree to a certain extent. I think, you know, the Prime Minister's you know, has made himself the Minister of the Union. I think that's right. He or she definitely should be. Um, I think it's the but it's the responsibility for every, I think, cabinet minister to be a minister for the union. You know, they are British ministers responsible for the whole UK, not English ministers. Um, like I say, there may be some specific English responsibilities, but really they should be looking at the UK as a whole and really just where there's devolved powers, looking at how they can partner, how they can engage with the devolved authorities to support them to make it better. I think a prime example of that has been, you know, just as we've been facing COVID, you know, we've, we know that health is devolved. Absolutely. It's been very clear. Um, Nicola Sturgeon has had control of the hospitals, uh, you know, and, and primary healthcare in, in Scotland for a number of years. Um, but when we faced the pandemic, you know, the, the devolved health service didn't have the capacity to set up the testing centres as quickly to have the scale um, to make sure that obviously vaccine rollout could happen at the, the rate that we wanted. So that's when we were able to leverage support from central government. So bringing in the British Army to make sure that vaccines could be set up uh, and administered more quickly, make sure that testing centres could be set up. And actually the Department of Health, for the first time in many years, doing d direct delivery in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland with those test centres and those testing facilities. I think that's a really positive thing. Um, it shows exactly why you can be a proud nation of Scotland and also um, you know, a very proud country that is the United Kingdom. It's that virtue, it's that duality, which I think is a real benefit um, for, for Scotland and for England too. Can I just ask you, Luke, on the point you just made there about um, the, devol the uh, devolve and forget attitude that there'd been in the first 20 years of devolution. When we spoke to Vernon Bogdanor a couple months ago, he was talking about the impacts that devolved decisions have on the overall outcomes for the UK. So things like productivity, the skills base, people's health and well-being. These are all issues, along with infrastructure, of course, which have a huge bearing on the UK's competitiveness. And yet there, there are levers that no longer um, have anything to do with UK ministers sometimes. Is this an area where there should be intervention when needed? Um, obviously, were that to happen, you would have devolved ministers crying that this is anti-democratic, that it is you know, not respecting the settlement. Or is it something where we just have to accept that these are in devolved hands and the outcomes are you know, for those governments that feel responsible for? Well, I, I think this is the uh, you know, interpretation of devolution that many have held uh, for the past two decades, that once it's devolved, it's no longer your responsibility. So it's essentially kind of walling off certain powers and policy areas. And the, the SNP, the Nationalists, have really taken that interpretation and then said to Westminster, if it's devolved, you can't touch it. I had this many times when I was an MP. I'd be talking about sometimes devolved issues which directly impacted my area, which constituents would be writing uh, to me about they wanted me to take action on because they weren't getting the right results from some of the local MSPs. Um, and I would, I would get involved in those issues. And then the SNP would shout at me and say these devolvers shouldn't be involved. And that's, I, I think that's the, the really negative interpretation of devolution and, and actually not how it was intended. The whole point of devolution was trying to empower more communities across Scotland, Wales, uh, that hadn't had that power, you know, or hadn't seen that power for a number of years because they weren't getting that transparency in Westminster. Um, what we've seen is actually, you know, powers have been transferred. They've then um, been accumulated in Edinburgh uh, to a certain extent in Cardiff too. And they've gathered those powers together and they haven't given them to the communities, the local governments to truly, really empower them, encourage more community engagement. They've, they've held them up. And um, I was very clear when I became an MP that I wanted to work with every level of government and actually start connecting the dots to get the best possible result. Because when you connect local government with devolved government and central government, that's where you can get some of the best possible results. And, I, you know, I carried this through when we, we got into government. I you know, uh, did a lot of work with the Eternal Market um, Act. 
which actually look, you know, look to redefine some of those relationships and really start the job of completing uh, devolution, which I think is you know, it's still a complete kind of template that's been rolled out across the country. There are many situations, pandemics as one example, economic shocks, that the frameworks aren't and that the full detail isn't bottomed out. Um, and actually, we do need some powers that central government can kind of step in and support devolved government and support local government. And in the Internal Market Act, we now have that. So the UK government can invest directly in educational facilities, in infrastructure, in economic development. Uh, so that could be green uh, investments. That could even be housing in certain uh, areas. So there's there's opportunities there for central government to complement devolved policy. Um, and that doesn't mean taking powers away from the devolved administration, but it does mean uh, adding on top of so it is additive in the same way that if you're in the United States, the federal government can sometimes act in the areas that are reserved to the states where they think it's right. If they want to have some federal level of education, federal level of health care, uh, federal level of economic support. Uh, and I think that's the you know, that's a lesson that we can take over here. Uh, and I think it will make the whole country work better. So just going a little bit further on that point, then. So you wrote in The Times shortly after you left uh, number 10 that the. Uh, devolve settlement has reached uh, its limits and that um, there was handing more powers was like giving um, school bullies your, your, your lunch money I think is how you phrased it D does that mean then that there has to be a reset of how the structure works at the UK level as well you know does there need to now be some sort of charter does there almost need to be a reframing of the acts of union as some have suggested or is it a case of just basically setting policy uh, mm -hmm. from Whitehall that there is not going there isn't the possibility of there being more powers you've got to use what you've got I mean what does that what does that look like in your mind so I think there's one uh, there's one point here about structures and there's another point here about uh, delivery and I think you know from a delivery point of view I think there is more work to do uh, I think we need to you know re-establish the fact that you've got kind of parliamentary sovereignty and as long as Scottish MPs are in Parliament voting on laws, becoming ministers, as we had just a, a few years ago, a Scottish Prime Minister, um, that they can still lead the country, then actually, you know, Westminster should be able to deliver projects in Scotland uh, as easily as an evolved administration or a local government uh, would be able to deliver um, in partnership or, or unilaterally if needed. Um, but when you also the, the kind of structural side, I mean, I think Westminster is constantly evolving. Um, you know, we saw reforms under the Labour government. We saw reforms under the coalition. We'll see more reforms uh, under this Conservative administration. And I think that's a really, po really positive step. And I think we should be constantly looking to improve the way Westminster works, the way Westminster um, is designed and the way it's at the heart of the, the national conversation. And again, I go back to you know, some of the design around the Internal Market Acts. You know, we were we made a specific mention there of common frameworks across the UK because these are some of the um, rules and regulations that were coming from Europe. We're now going to be the responsibility of the UK, either at central government level or devolved government level. Um, and actually having common frameworks, uh, you can, through consent and consultation, work together to establish common standards across the whole UK. And what I'd like to see in this kind of next evolution of, of Westminster governance is that really Parliament becomes back at the heart of the national conversation. So if England or Wales or Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, wants to introduce a new standard, uh, wants to do something innovative, they can start it uh, in the devolved space, but then can escalate it through their MPs into Westminster. So then they can make it a UK wide piece of legislation. So, I mean, if you, you, know, you can start with the smoking, ba smoking bans, plastic, um, yeah, plastic bag charges, you can then uh, elevate it to more lofty kind of green and climate change goals that could start at devolved level and then be escalated to Westminster to make it a UK wide standard. And so it's kind of repurposing Westminster a little bit. So it's not just top down, but it's bottom up. And then I think, you know, separately, as I said about the structures, I think the intergovernmental review will be important because I think we need to really give citizens transparency over how devolved uh, local and central government works. I know I do at the moment is very focused on devolved and central government, but if you are clear about when people meet, what policies are being discussed where, I think that gives people a little bit more confidence in the system. And then they at least can see where politicians are engaging with each other. They can then kind of focus on substance rather than you know column inches and, and broadcast hours being filled with oh we haven't been invited to this meeting or we've been excluded from that meeting um and, and you know going into this kind of grievance politics which doesn't benefit you know citizens or already politicians 
So it sounds as if, um, to, to your mind, devolution is obviously here to stay and it's something that can be used to the benefit of uh, citizens. What do you say to those Conservatives then that think that it's simply a mechanism for nation building and ultimately independence and should be done away with? Because that appears to be a growing sentiment amongst many of our uh, fellow members. Well, and if you if you look at Wales, you know as well, it's a it's a growing sentiment amongst the overall population. You know, the the abolish uh, party is really gaining momentum in, in Wales just now. Um, and so, but I think it, the answer is it depends on who has their hands of the kind of levers of power. If you have a you know, unionist party um, that's dedicated to actually delivery and making things better um, in uh, you know at the devolved level, then I think devolution can work really well. Um, if you've got a nationalist administration that's going to spend you know, 25 million on international affairs, even though international affairs are explicitly reserved and spend that money there rather than putting it into education, rather than putting it into devolved health care, rather than helping you know, cut cancer waiting list times, then, you know, then that is unfortunately a twisting of, the, uh, of devolved powers. But I do think that you know, people at the devolved level and people in Scotland should be able to make that choice whether they want to have that kind of nationalist administration and they see the result. But also hopefully they will have the chance in the not too distant future to see a unionist party back in charge of, of Scotland so they can see how positive devolution can be. And, and furthermore, I think the most important bit is that we need to hold the SNP to their promises with the Smith Commission where they signed up to actually devolving more power to the local government level, um, because that simply hasn't happened. Uh, they've taken more and more power and centralised in, in Edinburgh, um, but they haven't given it out. And if you speak to any of the communities in, in rural Scotland, up in the Highlands and Islands as well, they're desperate for more power. They want more flexibility. You saw Shetland uh, just a few months ago um, vote in support of his own self-determination to be out of Scotland uh, and perhaps in the UK or have a separate set of arrangements uh, and that's what you know both Edinburgh and London should be working together to address. The, for all the talk about structures and making intergovernmental relations work <clears throat> and doing things on a UK-wide basis um, the fact is that uh, when devolution was set up just over 20 years ago um, certainly in Britain uh, all three parts uh, were governed by Labour um, and now we seem to be uh, we seem to be in a pretty set position where all three parts of Britain, leave aside Northern Ireland for obvious reasons, uh, are run by different parties. Um, and one party in Scotland doesn't want to uh, make devolution work as the permanent constitutional uh, state. So going back to your example about uh, America and the federal government doing things, that would that's based on the idea that all of the, the 50 states still want to be part of America. We don't have uh, a governor of Michigan who wants to take it out of the Union and secede. I mean, how do you, in political terms, um, get around those pretty big structural uh, structural problems? I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, when Labour set up uh, devolution, which I argue it, you know, it was quite rushed, they didn't consider the fact that there would be different parties in different parts of the UK at the devolved level. Um, I think they thought Wales and Scotland were, were in their pocket and it would they'd have um, you know government in perpetuity in uh, in those parts of the UK. And then it didn't matter if there was a Tory government in uh, you know in London, they could still uh, hold it up in, in Edinburgh and Cardiff. So I mean that's the problem when you have a party set up you know such a major constitutional change and not do the deep constitutional thinking to make it robust enough um, to work for all uh, eventualities. And unfortunately, through our, it's one of the downsides of our organic constitution is that where it's constantly evolving, it then can be subject to the, the women fiat of the government of the time. Um, and now I'm not advocating going for a full kind of codified constitution, because I think at this stage of our development, it would... Um, it would cause as many arguments as it would settle. But I think, you know, as much as we have we have agreed, you know, dev devolution and we've agreed also that local governments have more power, um, I think we can establish some structures and principles that most parties could buy into, um, apart from obviously the, the SNP who want to break up the UK. Um, and they don't want devolution to work. They want to separate out. And, you know, if you had a separate Scotland, it would be a very, you know, authoritarian, if the SNP were in it, very authoritarian place. You know, that is their... Those are their policies, the named persons um, the bill they're trying to put through, took power away from parents and put it into other people. Um, yeah, you've got the hate crime bill, um, which you know, limits on, on freedom of expression. Um, when, of course, you need to protect against discrimination, but then it starts entering into the home and telling people what to say. Um, and, you know, the, their, their approach to things will be very, very authoritarian. So 
voters need to decide. Um, but I do think we need to open up the conversation of what a separate Scotland would look like um, and you know, how these you know, structures would can work better within the existing arrangement rather than just promise the milk and honey of, of separation uh, and then condemn you know, Britain as a kind of uh, outdated um, imperialist model. Just quickly, finally, on that political fragmentation point, I mean, the um, the first leaders debates uh, in the Scottish elections took place last night. Um, and one of the one of the arguments that Nicola Sturgeon returned to again and again was uh, once we've got through the pandemic, who do you want to be making decisions about Scotland's future? Uh, does it should it be uh, an elected Scottish Parliament or should it be Boris Johnson in Westminster? Um, does the fact that we've had uh, succession of conservative governments uh, elected primarily on English votes make that argument about uh, shared political purpose harder to make does it does that play into the SNP's hands or what can be done about that is that just a symptom of the election results in the electoral system yeah I, I, mean, I think this is one of the the biggest kind of false choices that the SNP put to people in Scotland that you know somehow you don't have a say of what's going on in Westminster that's not true. You know, I, I live, work, represent, you know, a Scottish constituency, I, I did as an MP. When I was in number 10, I was directly influencing uh, policy and decision making from that kind of Scottish perspective and making sure that our voice was heard at the, you know, at the highest levels. Um, and there are Scottish MPs of all parties, you know, SNP, Labour, Liberal Democrat and Conservative in Parliament, making sure Scotland's voice is heard. And you know, during the Theresa May administration, you know, we held the Scottish Conservatives held the government in power, um, and so Scotland did. You know, it, it kind of forced the Conservative government on England. Um, so you know, it is because of the numbers that were achieved. So this kind of false choice of saying that you know we can only have our own you know uh, make it have our own way by detaching ourselves from Westminster is a really false choice. I think there's a secondary to that. I think it's even more disingenuous for Nicola Sturgeon to argue this when you know she hates having any power in Westminster or any ability for Scottish MPs to lead the rest of the UK from London. Um, but she's fine with it being in Brussels. Now, I, look, I, I was a key part of the uh, Remain campaign. You know, I wanted us to remain inside the European Union, but I respect referendum results just as I would have respected 2014 if it had gone the other way. Um, and what you're looking at is that the SNP hate Westminster so much um, and are so anti other parts of the UK that they can't stand to be part of a system where we have direct representation, where we get a lot more economically, socially, culturally from other parts of the UK than we do from Europe. And yet they're quite happy to transfer powers to Brussels, where there's an even greater democratic deficit for Scotland. They don't have that direct um, you know, executive level representation there. I mean, I, I don't think there's ever been a Scottish head of the EU Commission where there have been plenty Scottish prime ministers so uh, of the United Kingdom. And so this is a false choice put by the, uh, the SNP. And the quicker that we torpedo this and expose it for the, the lie it is, um, I think the better. Well, we may come on to talk about how unionists make that case, because I think you're right that the uh, the SNP have been pushing ever since Brexit the the line that independence is almost a natural state of things. Scotland's place should be uh, as a small independent nation within the European Union, uh, rather than in part of this this outdated union that doesn't work and is having things uh, done to Scotland against its will. And how unionists can um, can counter that case. If I can, before we do that, just ask about what happens next. So uh, the election's coming up in just over a month's time. Uh, there's been a bit of a wobble uh, in support for both independence and the SNP, but uh, I think broadly the, uh, the central planning assumption is that the SNP will remain in government, whether on their own uh, or uh, in coalition or confidence and supply. If that does happen, we know from the SNP because they've set out in a roadmap what happens next on their side. They will make a request for a Section 30 order as they did uh, in 2012 in order to hold the 2014 referendum from the UK government. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear uh, that he will say no to that, at which point the SNP have said we will legislate from Holyrood and they've already published a draft bill and challenged the UK government uh, to take them on in the courts. Um, Everyone knows that the Prime Minister will say no to any request that comes for a Section 30 order, but what should the UK government do next? 
Well, I mean, I, firstly, I think it's important to just know that you know Nicola Sturgeon on the uh, you know in those leaders' debates last night said that her number one priority was you know tackling COVID and the pandemic, and um, that that simply isn't true because just in those last few weeks of the the Scottish Parliament being in session, they lodged the the draft pill to break up the United Kingdom or at least try to. So again, their their focus, every action, every policy, um, every statement is designed explicitly or implicitly to break up Scotland and to put a wedge between Scotland and the rest of the UK, which is biggest market and closest connection. So I think that's the, you know, that is again needs exposed time and time again, that the SNP are disingenuous in the way they govern. I think if it comes to, you know, asking for a, a second referendum, I, I, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, different parts of the UK should be able to hold referenda. Uh, they should be able to you know, vote as we, you know, in Scotland did in 2014 and make a decision. Um, what I don't think is is helpful is to have these referenda kind of on a rolling basis until you get the right answer. You know, the, the UK is a you know, law abiding country. Um, it is always it, it tries to establish um, you know, national and international presidents, say, and the 2014 referendum was internationally regarded as a kind of showpiece. Um, you know, referendum on on separation. Um, it was fair. It was clear. Everyone knew the repercussions. And you know, fifty five percent of the people voted to remain inside the UK. Now, the SNP can argue that the situation's changed because of Brexit. But to be fair, you know, we knew going into the twenty fifteen that there was a party that wanted to uh, have a referendum. Other parties wanted to break out of the European Union. That was an ongoing discussion. Um, and also, you know over a million Scots voted to leave the European Union as well. So it's not, you know, it's not as, as, as cut and dry as the SNP make it. But I think, you know, we need to be clear with people to say, yes, of course, have a referendum. But, you, you know, if we keep having a thrilling basis, it undermines the system. Uh, it, it undermines business confidence. It hampers opportunities. You know, I've, I've spoken to businesses who won't invest in Scotland because they're caught up by this constant uncertainty of another referendum to break up the UK. So that's denying jobs and opportunities to, to young people. That's not what anyone should be aiming for. Um, but if, so if they come for another request, I think it's right for the, you know, in the short term for this to be refused by, by MPs and, uh, in, in Westminster. Uh, and for, you know, I know a number of Scottish MPs, you know, Labour, Liberal Democrat, Conservative, will, would vote against any such proposals as well, because they want to focus on the recovery from COVID um, and actually getting more opportunities for people in Scotland, because that's going to be the most important thing. Um, the SNP will, you know, they'll, they'll ask, and I'll tell you what, if they got another referendum and they lost it, it would only be another two years before they'd be asking for it again, because something else would have changed. The world is constantly changing. But you don't need to break up your country to meet those new challenges uh, or, or, or new situations. You can actually work with a system where you have directly elected uh, MPs to get in government and change things yourself. I mean, if you want to change things, run and be an MP, become a minister. Hey, go for prime minister uh, and show the fact that Scotland can lead not only Scotland, which is a proud nation, but the entire country of the United Kingdom. Can I ask a, a final question on something that we haven't really talked about, actually, but is obviously would have obviously been part of your uh, remit in the Union Unit, and that's Northern Ireland. Um, there's been a lot of uh, friction, um, political friction, since the introduction of the Northern Ireland Protocol fully at the beginning of the year, <clears throat> as well as uh, questions about what the future constitutional status of of should be for the island of Ireland, with conversations happening in the Republic and uh, in the North. How alive is uh, government, from your experience, to the conversations that are now happening about uh, what the future is for Northern Ireland, and particularly in this centenary year? I think they're very alive to it. And, and although uh, you know, Northern Ireland uh, was an area I probably had, had the least involvement in, uh, you know, in, in my time in government, because the focus very much was on Scotland and Wales, and because you've got the ongoing work with the Northern Ireland office, um, it, you know, I think you know the the centre of government is very alive to the the centenary year. Um, you know, you've got various policy issues coming out. You know the you've seen the, the, the discussions in Parliament about legacy issues, about victims payments, um, and all these are coming to the fore. And I think there's actually a, a real opportunity for Northern Ireland in, in in the next year or two to bring these all these different issues together, all these you know, historical issues and also future opportunities to kind of relaunch Northern Ireland. 
Um, it's in a, you know, it's it, once I think some of the issues have been overcome about the Northern Irish Protocol. Um, I think once that has settled uh, and the EU and the UK has have, have, have reached a kind of um, a steady state position, I think there can be a real opportunity for Northern Ireland and people living in Northern Ireland to be one of the most prosperous parts of the UK. And I think it's, it, you know, government, are, are, you know, I would recommend that government needs to look at it as optimistically as possible. You know, the money's been committed there. Now it's actually about you know, executing with the Northern Irish executive um, and uh, with local communities to make sure more opportunities and more benefits uh, come to Northern Ireland.